Uh, today's topic is automate, simplify, and get on with life. Um, screen is not moving. Okay, uh, so uh, first, uh, the normal disclaimers. I'm not an investment professional. I'm, I, I'm a blogger. I write stuff uh, online, and that's it. Uh, everything that I write is just my personal opinion, uh, nothing professional, just my uh, do-it-yourself experience. I don't have an advisor, although I maintain an advisor directory, uh, I don't personally use one. Uh, any company that I mention, I have no uh, financial relationship with them. Uh, at most, I'm just a customer. Uh, any product features are obviously uh, controlled by the companies. Uh, I, I cannot uh, influence them, and uh, I can only report what they are as of today. Um, so before this meeting, I asked uh, Gene to send out the link uh, to Rick Ferry's The Education of an Index Investor. This is a presentation that he came to our chapter about two years ago, uh, back in May 2022. Uh, I took a slide out of his presentation. Uh, he describes four stages of uh, index investor. That describes my journey uh, pretty well. Uh, so the first stage is darkness. You don't know anything. I didn't know anything. I went through picking individual stocks, um, market timing, uh, investing, active management, uh, act actively managed funds, and the whole nine yard. Uh, after losing a lot of money or not go going anywhere, I find indexing. So that's the enlightenment stage. Um, so uh, like everybody else, I found I read uh, Jack Bogle's book, uh, William Bernstein's book, uh, Rick Ferry's book. Wow, indexing, that, that's a really eye opener. So I changed my tactics to indexing. Um, so, But with that, um, I went to the dark side on the complexity side. Uh, added a bunch of other things, uh, small value, com commodity futures, uh, just uh, made it uh, really complex. And then uh, I listened to Rick Ferry's uh, presentation. On the final stage, uh, Nirvana is simplicity. That really reson uh, resonated with me. So uh, I took some steps uh, to go there. So today's uh, talk, my goal is if you're at complexity stage, maybe thinking of doing something to achieve simplicity. If you're not at complexity, just skip that step. Go directly to simplicity. Uh, in the presentation, uh, I don't know whether the presentation itself will be uh, distributed. Uh, if it will be, then all these green links are linking uh, to either the video or additional blog posts of mine or Bogleheads forum discussions. So you can click on those. Neighbors uh, before they, uh, the board, Mike and Sherry Evanoff, and then they saw they moved the. Okay. Um, so before I continue, I should say simplicity isn't optimal or the best by itself. Because after all, uh, when we go through complexity, we have a goal. There is a reason that we chase those complex complexity. So if you are going to go, simpl uh, go to towards simplicity, then you have to give up uh, those either perceived or concrete goals uh, for your quote unquote uh, optimization. The problem with uh, always having an optimizing mindset is it uh, induces FOMO, fear of missing out. We hear the saying that uh, complex, uh, comparison is the thief of, uh, joy, of joy or something like that. So by definition, if you're always com optimizing, you're always comparing. Am I doing the best? Somebody else is doing better. Uh, maybe I should jump on that. Um, so that just... Uh, puts you into a con continuous FOMO mindset. When you pursue simplicity, um, you're saying, hey, there is some, some of those small things. I don't need those. I'm willing to give up those uh, for a better goal. Uh, I have a higher goal to achieve. Um, one of the higher goal is just uh, you tune out the noise. Uh, it's just somebody somewhere is always saying something. Um, it's like radio. Um, so right now we're sitting in a room. There are all kinds of signals uh, in the air. We don't hear them. It's quiet. Uh, but if you turn the radio on, then you hear them. You uh, turn the dial from one 
uh, frequency to the next frequency, you hear something else, and then you hear something else. It's a noisy, noisy world uh, out here. So if you always have your optimizing, uh, optimizing mindset, then it's like you have your radio constantly on. You always hear something, and you always hear something that 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 uh, pulls you, uh, give you something that you want to hear. Um, so going for simplicity is like turning off the radio. Then all of a sudden it's quiet, and you can focus. You can focus on something else. So. If you, you can focus, you, you're not constantly bombarded by the noise, it's easier to stay the course. So we also hear from behavior finance that the biggest enemy is the person that you see in the mirror in the morning. So the biggest uh, behavior mistakes is going to get you. So if you uh, don't have those noise, then you make fewer behavior mistakes. Uh, another benefit of going for simplicity is uh, that it's easier to understand uh, by both spouses. So some of us do most of the financial chores uh, in the family and our spouse uh, are uh, not as involved. Uh, we hear, oh, uh, people say, oh, I don't need an advisor, but uh, I'm looking for an advisor uh, in case I'm not able to uh, manage it after I die or after uh, I'm, I'm uh, getting into advanced age. If you simplify your finances enough, that, that your spouse can understand, then maybe you don't need a financial advisor for your spouse either. Um, so Rick Ferry said uh, a lot of people approached him saying, oh, I don't need a financial advisor now, but I left instructions uh, for my spouse to contact you. So according to him, uh, nobody actually did. So just having your spouse contacting somebody, it doesn't work in his experience. Somebody also said uh, you should uh, write uh, a death book or a death binder, uh, leaving, uh, uh, leaving all the details of how you manage finances, give instructions, um, write it down in detail so then somebody else can take it over. Uh, in my experience of over 15 years of writing, it doesn't work either. Because when you're writing the things, uh, you're making too many assumptions. A lot of things are just, of course, uh, you don't write it down because you think it's obvious, but it's not obvious to somebody else reading it. So every time I write something, even after all these years, uh, I always try to see uh, what am I missing? Am I missing something obvious? But the first question I usually get is something that I didn't write, something that I thought that was just obvious. Uh, everybody should already know, but it's not obvious. So again, if you make your finances simple and then you can maybe have your spouse manage it while you're still by uh, his or her side, then you can see uh, it's managed. Then, then you don't need a, a detailed instruction because both of you are uh, are onto it, uh, and then uh, it's it's easier uh, to be done. Um, so I asked uh, ChatGPT, "What is the opposite of FOMO?" It tells me it's JOMO, joy of missing out. So it turns the question uh, on its head. It's saying it's not fear. I'm I'm missing out some of the benefits. It's actually I'm doing it on purpose. I'm enjoying missing out on those noises. Uh, I I'm content uh, with what I have. Uh, whatever uh, small edges are out there, uh, I'm fine. Uh, I don't need those. So you actually enjoy the quietness. Uh, once you tune, uh, tune the noises out, what do you do? Uh, there are a lot of more important things in life. We have, if you're working, we have our career, uh, our family, uh, friendship, uh, health, fitness, uh, hobby, uh, our leisure, uh, even uh, reading a book, uh, uh, watching TV. Uh, it's all part of life. So uh, I'm going to share uh, some of the things I did uh, since I listened to Rick Ferry's talk. And then uh, I'm going to jump from uh, little things to little things. And then after I ran the uh, presentation through, then we're going to come back and then uh, uh, look at each one of these and then uh, answer your questions. So first, uh, in terms of the number of transactions in our financial life, 
credit cards is probably uh, the number one. We use credit cards for to buy all kinds of things. Uh, if you're in the maximizing uh, mindset, then you have um, multiple credit cards. You use a different card for different categories. I've been there. I have one card for gas, one card for groceries, another card for travel, and then another card uh, for uh, catch-all, everything else. And then uh, uh, maybe you see some cards are offering a signing bonus. Then you sign up, you uh, make the, number, the required uh, dollars of purchases, and then you put it in a sock drawer, and then you put in a reminder. Uh, the annual fee is going to kick in after 12 months, and then you're going to cancel it or you downgrade it to a no annual fee card. So all, all kinds of those things. Uh, it's just uh, uh, always in flux because the uh, programs change. So this card used to offer X percent on gas. Uh, it doesn't anymore. Or that card, a new card comes out, that's better. You got to move on to next one. So it requires a lot of attention. So uh, this is uh, what I'm doing now. So I got, got rid of all those cards. Uh, I have one card. Uh, my wife has one card. I use my card for everything. She uses her card for everything. And then we share one card as our backup in case the the card that we use has some problems. Or, you know, sometimes they have fraud. They have, they're have they going to send out a replacement card. So then uh, we need another card as a backup. Uh, in after credit cards, uh, our checking account is probably used the most. Um, so in conventional banking, you have a checking account, you have a savings account or a money market uh, fund. Um, then you use your checking account to receive money for direct deposit, your ACH, your check deposits. And then you use your checking account to pay your bills, to transfer out, write checks, to use ATM to take cash. And then you watch your balances because uh, if you have too much money in your checking account, you feel guilty, it's not earning interest. So you transfer into a savings account. And then you, you see, oh, checking accounts low or some large bills are coming up. Then you transfer back from the savings account to your checking account to pay your bills. So transfer in, transfer out, watching the balances. Uh, what do we do now? Uh, we merge the two. We just use one account, checking savings all together, just one combo account. All the money goes in, all the money comes out, just one account. Um, so we don't watch uh, balances. We don't transfer back and forth. So there are two accounts uh, that can do this. Uh, one from Fidelity called Fidelity Cash Management Account. Uh, so right now it pays 2.7% uh, by default. Uh, come next week, uh, it's going to have another default option to use a money market fund. Uh, the money market fund is going to pay about 5%. Vanguard has a separate account called Vanguard Cash Plus account. So right now it pays 4.6%. So if you compare these accounts with your high yield savings account, probably pays a little less, um, but every dollar earns that same rate. So you're not transferring back and forth. You're not having a checking account that pays very little. So on balance, you're not missing much, but it's so convenient and uh, you don't. It, it doesn't require as much attention. The Fidelity account has been around for maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, Vanguard Cash Plus account is new, relatively new, only came out in the last maybe couple of years. Uh, it doesn't have a, a debit card or a bill pay service. So it gives you a routing number and account number. Uh, you can do direct deposits, you can do direct debits. So your credit card payments, you can give the routing number and account number to the credit card company for them to debit. Uh, it's just, it doesn't have those uh, debit cards or physical checks or bill pay service. Um, so in terms of paying bill, uh, my goal is to have every bill paid automatically without me doing anything. So if I go somewhere uh, out of the country for three months uh, without internet access, I want all my bills still paid. All I need is to have enough money in my account. So there are two ways you can do this. Uh, one is auto pay. So auto pay is you give your account to whoever is billing you. 
uh, if they take a credit card, you give them a credit card. If they don't take credit card or they charge a fee, you give them a uh, the your spending account uh, for them to debit. So the bills that on the left hand side, all the bills will charge your credit card. Some of the bills will charge your spending account. Um, so in this setup, I already let you bill bill whatever whenever. Then. Um, if I'm out of the country for three months, then you you bill. It's it's your responsibility. All my bills are paid. Um, the second way of doing this is you use a bill pay service within your account. Um, the bill pay service would interact with your bills. You set up your biller as uh, vendors in your bill pay. And then you're still, uh, if the bills, they take a credit card, you give them a credit card, but eventually your credit card is going to send a e-bill uh, to your bill pay service uh, to say what is the monthly balance uh, on this card. And then your bill pay service will pay the credit card. Uh, utilities or your property tax, you set up those as vendors. Uh, they don't charge credit card, but again, you need the e-bill uh, capability to say what is the bill. Uh, if it's a fixed amount, then you don't need e-bill, but if it's a variable account, then your bill pay service needs to uh, know how much is due and then eventually pay them. Um, because you're using your account, the bill pay service is like your contractor. Uh, you're responsible. If anything uh, goes wrong, if your bill pay service uh, paid late or if the, they didn't get the e-bill for some reason, then to your billers, it's like you didn't pay. So uh, I use auto pay just for easy uh, management. You can also use a combination uh, for the uh, vendors that you trust, you let them bill directly to your account. Uh, for the vendors you don't quite trust, you use your bill pay service, uh, something like that. But the end goal is still the same. Try to get every bill paid. Uh, don't do any uh, manual bill payment, uh, write any uh, physical checks and, and do all of those. Um, CDs. So last time I came here, we talked about CDs. Uh, conventionally, uh, we buy CDs from different banks because uh, we can always find some banks and credit unions are having a special a promo rate. So you end up with one CD from this, this bank, another CD from this credit union, another CD from a third credit union and all those things. Um, you have multiple accounts, multiple logins and get multiple 1099 forms. I used to because there are so many, I have to have a, a checklist uh, at the end of the year to see which 1099 I'm still missing. Uh, did I get all of them? Um, the, with the banks, they have a problem in that they offer a special or a promo on one CD. But once the promo expires, uh, they automatically renew you to another term. But the new term, it may not be so special it may actually be a, a very bad rate. Uh, they do this on purpose with some odd terms. You may have a 13 month CD that's on special, but it renews to a 12 month CD. The 12 month CD pays a very late rate, a very low rate. So you really have to watch um, all, the, uh, all the maturities. Uh, they give you a very short window. Uh, you, do you do have time to tell them, I don't want to renew. But it, again, that's a chore. And if you're not paying attention, you end up renewing to a very low rate. And then by the time it already renews, and then you want to uh, take an early withdrawal, then they charge you early withdrawal penalty easing into your uh, new principal. So you end up actually uh, uh, paying back all the promo, the special rates that you, you, that you got. So here, the renewal trap, I linked to a forum uh, discussion. Uh, somebody's uh, parents, I think, uh, they had a good CD and then uh, renewed to 0.05%, even in this interest rate environment. They asked the bank, that's the way it is. Uh, you missed the window, uh, that's how they treat you.
So uh, instead of buying CDs, um, nowadays uh, I got rid of all my bank accounts. Uh, I just buy treasuries. So if you used to buy a one-year CD, you can buy a one-year treasury. Whatever term that you, you want for your CD, just buy the treasury. Treasuries, by definition, they're market, uh, so they offer market rates. It's uh, a sort of like indexing. Um, they don't. They never offer any deals, but you, they don't cheat, uh, like offering these uh, lower than market rates or offer to renew to uh, super low rates. Uh, you already have your brokerage account, so no new accounts, same login, same 10, 1099 form. So any treasuries uh, don't renew. So don't, again, uh, uh, at least by default, the treasury is just paying uh, into your cash account. Um, so if you're buying a CD because you have something that's coming up, you have a schedule. So the treasury just matures and then you use your money on uh, whatever you want to use. Some brokers like Fidelity, uh, they, they offer an auto roll so you can have a, a ladder of some sort. Uh, so you have your three months uh, treasury, and then after the three months is up, it automatically buys the next three months treasury. So it just uh, rolls forward. Uh, any roll will always get the market rate. Again, treasury, there are no bad rates in treasury. No good rates, but no bad rates either. Um, and then if you're buying treasuries in a, we're talking to Californians, uh, so treasuries are not taxable in California. Uh, they're not taxed uh, by, uh, by the state. So that helps. Uh, I bonds. So last time I came uh, here, presented I bonds. And when I bonds were paying uh, very high rates, uh, I had a uh, one personal account for me, one personal account for my wife. We had one trust. I created another trust. We had a business account. So all they create all these business accounts, all these accounts uh, to maximize the purchase of iBonds because it has a $10,000 purchase limit. And we also have the gift box that so we buy gifts uh, to each other and put them uh, into the gift box and then uh, wait until following years to deliver the gifts and then the whole nine yard. Uh, I went, uh, I overpaid my taxes to buy another $5,000 in I bonds, uh, again, uh, just to maximize the purchases. Uh, it all works. Uh, multiple accounts work. Uh, the gift box works. Uh, buying and redeeming, uh, it's all done by the Treasury Direct system. Uh, and that, that's all uh, good and dandy. Uh, but Treasury Direct, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, human power. So anything that requires uh, human processing takes a long time. Uh, I'm linking to a forum discussion. They call it eternal wait. So anything that you need uh, manual processing, such as transferring from one account to another, somebody said it took 10 months uh, to transfer out of a trust uh, after their parents died uh, to the beneficiaries. Uh, and then they, for 10 months, they had to contact their Congress representatives and senator's office uh, to get it uh, accelerated. A uh, Wall Street Journal uh, journalist uh, emailed me saying that uh, somehow they misplaced one of their account numbers. Um, Treasury Direct uses account number to log in. So without the account number, you can't log in. They went through customer service. Customer service said, oh, their answers weren't good enough for them to recover their account. They had to send in a paper form. So again, they send in the paper form for a number of months, uh, nothing. So they asked me what to do. Say, well, nothing. Uh, uh, contact your uh, congressperson or senator. So with all those, now that the iBonds craze is over, um, I redeemed all my iBonds. Uh, I'm still holding some old iBonds. I'm not buying anything new, uh, just uh, waiting for them to run off. Those iBonds still have a 3%. Uh, fixed rate. I bought them in early 2000s, so they're coming up uh, in next in the next uh, seven or eight years. Uh, then after they're done, then uh, I'm out of I bonds. So instead of buying I bonds, I just uh, buy a tips fund, uh, um, tips mutual fund. Um, I'm not using a tips ladder. I heard uh, from someone from last year's Bogo has conference that the tips ladder has become a mania. 
Um, so I, I wrote a book on tips. So I know how a tips ladder works. It works for many people. Uh, it's just personally, I don't need it. A tips fund works just as well for me. Um, the, uh, I don't necessarily need a preset cash flow. So if I need cash, I'll just uh, generate from my uh, portfolio. If I need to sell stocks because I need to rebalance anyway, so I just uh, sell some stocks and then take those as cash. Uh, I'm fine with that. Um, a key difference between a tips fund and the uh, individual tips is that uh, there are interest rate in, in the tips fund. So if I need to sell from tips fund, I'm only selling a small percentage anyway. So uh, the interest rate is not a big deal for me. So if I'm selling 3%, even the tips fund is down 20%. So I lose 20% on my 3%. Uh, not a big deal. My 97% is still there. My 97% is getting a higher yield at that point. Um, over time, uh, I, I balance out. Um, so in terms of investment, um, with a complex portfolio, you have multiple funds, multiple accounts. Um, it gets uh, pretty complicated when you try to rebalance. So what do we do? Uh, first of all, if you have multiple accounts of the same type, multiple Roth IRAs, multiple 401ks or traditional IRAs, get them together. So I used to have accounts at both uh, Fidelity and Vanguard. I see I'm using Fidelity more and more. So uh, just recently, Vanguard sent out a notice of some fee increases. So just uh, prompted me saying, I, I don't need a Vanguard account anyway. So I just rolled my Vanguard accounts into Fidelity. Now I have even fewer accounts than before. Uh, to simplify a complex portfolio, you can do a target date fund. So you just have one fund and then whatever uh, tilts uh, or like uh, Rick Ferry was saying, icing, then you can add on top. So use something as your base and then add whatever you need. Uh, Paul Merriman used to have a ultimate buy and hold portfolio that uses 13 funds. So even Paul Merriman came out with a two funds for life. So that simplified it to a target date plus small value because Paul Merriman is a fan of uh, small value. Uh, so again, you have a base and then you add uh, whatever you need. Uh, and here I'm linking to a, a forum discussion. It's called one fund portfolio as the default. So instead of uh, having all, all these components, you start with one fund and only add on top of it when you need. If it's too drastical to go to just one fund, uh, you can do total market funds. Uh, just three or four funds, like uh, Rick Ferry was saying. Uh, Taylor has the three fund portfolio. Everybody should be from already familiar with. Uh, Rick Ferry has uh, the core four portfolios. Uh, so four funds instead of three. So three or four, doesn't matter, pick your flavor. Uh, Rick Ferry's core four has six different flavors. Uh, pick something, uh, mix and match, um, make that your base. Uh, easy to understand, uh, easy to rebalance. Uh, Rick Ferry, uh, the whole presentation is about this. Uh, the question is always, if I'm already complex, how do I go from here to there? Uh, if it's in a IRA, Roth IRA, uh, that's easy. No tax consequences. Uh, once you make up your mind, you can sell and re reallocate. If it's a taxable account, you already have a lot of uh, unrealized capital gains. Uh, first uh, step is stop buying more. So you don't you turn off dividend reinvestment, the, direct the dividends to somewhere else. Uh, and then if you need to donate or sell whenever you rebalance, sell out of those, uh, then slowly uh, it'll whittle it down. Uh, if you uh, harvested losses, like in 2022, early 2023, market was down, uh, you can harvest some losses from your other positions and then use those losses to offset the gains from selling the funds that you don't need. Um, so with regard to dividends, uh, in tax advantage accounts, I have everything set to automatic, automatically reinvest. 
uh, in taxable accounts, if you uh, I'm still accumulate, I would automatically reinvest, except the funds that I don't need uh, or I'm trying to get out of. Uh, if I'm now that I'm in decumulation, uh, I just uh, automatically uh, withdraw all those dividends uh, to the spending account. So every uh, every broker uh, should have this. Uh, Fidelity has it. Vanguard has it. So the dividend doesn't necessarily uh, just go into your cash. Uh, if you are you have a bank account or you use one of those uh, spending account, the Vanguard Cash Plus or the Fidelity Cash Management account, you can say all my uh, dividends should go to that account. It can go to an external account or an internal account. Uh, so look for something like uh, called automatic withdrawal plan or something like that. If you can't find it, ask customer service, and they'll redirect you. They'll direct you to it. Um, OK, so just uh, one tip uh, that I want to share with regard to rebalancing. Um, so after you uh, simplify to a handful of asset classes, uh, you can consolidate them. So all the accounts uh, of different types uh, are of different sizes. So to me, uh, my HSAs are my small accounts uh, because the contributions are, uh, contribution limits are lower. And also I've had HSAs uh, for fewer years. So those are pretty small. I just invest them in just one asset class. It holds the international accounts to me. It can hold uh, whatever uh, uh, asset class you choose there. If it only holds one funds or one asset class, it doesn't need to be, to be rebalanced. Whenever you rebalance, you don't need to touch those because whenever you rebalance, uh, you're, you're only rebalancing, you're only uh, shifting uh, a small percentage from one asset class to another anyway. So if you can keep your uh, small accounts clean with just one asset class, then like here, if I need to move from US to international, I sell all of US to international. All these accounts, they they don't have to uh, they don't have to do uh, be touched. So then you you only do transactions in one account to rebalance. Um, so uh, that that's been helpful to me. So we do all these. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, so I make this uh, my model, my new model. It's called a few make fewer things matter. So a lot of those small things, they do have some benefits, but do they matter? Uh, I want to make them not matter. Uh, I want to focus on the things that are really important to me. Um, I recently uh, moved into a new neighborhood. Uh, so the neighborhood has a, a neighborhood uh, directory. The neighbors write something about uh, what they care in life, uh, why they moved here. So I put those into a tool that generated this. Uh, this is called a word cloud. Uh, the things that people mention more frequently, uh, they are featured more prominently. So people here, they're, they're coming here to ski, bike, hike, you can see friends, gardens, golf, uh, fishing. These are more important uh, in life, at least uh, to me at this life stage. So I want to simplify and automate finance uh, to pursue these goals. And, and if I know uh, why I'm doing this, then I can overcome my tendency. Oh, I want to catch those uh, another 0.1% here, or another 0.2% there. So uh, that's my brief presentation to you. Uh, any comments or questions, we'll go over in Q&A. If after the Q&A, you, know, you can always find me. Um, so I have my contact form there. Mm -hmm.